So I will hand it over to you, Steve. Um, for thanks very welcome. much, Wade. You're welcome. Great. Okay. Well, thanks to Tom for the uh, talk. It's always good uh, catching up with Tom. And to all you guys for uh, tuning in and uh, actually suffering listening to me. <laughs> we'll see if we can give you something a little bit interesting. Um, I didn't want to turn this purely into a, a safety talk about cameras, uh, but trying to put something together uh, that is all encompassing that uh, everybody can walk away with is quite difficult. Uh, camera work is a unique thing, a very unique discipline. Everybody does it differently. Everybody wants something different out of it. And we're all using totally different setups. So I'm happy to turn this into as much question and answer as uh, anybody wants. Um, and just to run through some basics and show you some scary videos as to why I think uh, you ought to make safety absolute paramount with uh, camera work and, uh, and go from there. Um, okay, uh, firstly, I, I see people fit into three types of uh, camera flyer. Um, the, the first would be um, the, the fun jumper who just puts a, a uh, uh, an action cam on the head of GoPro or one of the Sony's or one of the little tiny cameras and they go out and they film whatever they get. Um, that's I think where most of us are starting these days. Um, the second one would be a, a work camera jumper, somebody that's filming tandems, filming AFF, they're filming a team, uh, they're filming a, a record or a, a big way or something that needs debriefing. So they go out to just basically do a job to capture some imagery and um, and and for people to be able to utilize that uh, in in their um, you know in whether whether it's for their tandem or whether it's for the, the jumps debrief, and after that we tend to see people going into the specialist stuff where they want to get artistic images or artistic video, uh, and there's quite a few people doing that over the world, and some of the stuff that's coming out is is really quite exciting. Um, what I've I'm keen to do, when I've gone around the, the DZs, I've tried to run a safety seminar and I'm aiming it at mostly the people that are just starting out at uh, camera work or the people that are thinking of doing it uh, because that's where we can actually start by setting up people with a safe camera setup. Um, I urge everybody to always work safety first. Um, one of the things I would like to see more of are cutaway systems on camera helmets. Uh, it's a thing, a lot of camera helmets have them, but I see an awful lot of people jumping cameras without being able to, to cut away. Um, it's, it's a recipe for disaster if there's any kind of entanglement and you can't get rid of the camera. Um, the idea that uh, you know, you're gonna cut away your main, you might have an RSL deploying reserve and everything is still attached to your helmet could be just a, an absolute nightmare. So, um, something to think about. I've actually got a video here, let's, uh, so I don't talk too much. Um, let's uh, see what I can find here, which um, might give you an idea of where things can sort of go wrong. Um, try something like this, uh, where we've got a, um, a tandem videographer. Uh, she's over the ocean. Uh, she has those uh, good fun, um, interesting openings. And we see a cutaway and we see a, a reserve deployment and the main is still attached. Uh, getting pretty ugly there. The lines you can see are actually reserve lines. And we're now trying to sort the mess out and trying to get something up above our head. Um, we can see we've managed to keep the handles there wrapped in the lines as well. Uh, the connector link you see there is actually hooked around the camera and the camera has been ripped off her head and is now part way up the lines. Um, the good news on something like this is she did make it back to land uh, with all her gear, but it could have gone horribly wrong. Just showing it again in slow motion to give you guys an idea of just how fast things go wrong and they tend to go wrong at deployment height. So let's stay safe with all this. Okay, we sort of get the idea of, um, of how things go from there. 
Okay, did everybody catch that one okay? I'm new to this sort of technology, so. Uh, so I work in cutaway and maybe even just rethink your reserve drills before you actually cut away. Maybe run a hand over the top of your, your, your camera to make sure nothing's actually hooked up with it uh, before you actually do your cutaway. Just something else to think about there. Um, when you're actually building your uh, camera system, make it as snag free as possible. You know, avoid the traditional um, GoPro mount. Start looking at things like the, uh, the cookie roller mount, stuff that's just got minimal snag hazards to it. Uh, it. It can all just go horribly wrong in a second. As I say, we're at deployment height when things go like this do go wrong. And a lot of it could be very avoidable just by making sure we haven't got any big snags up there. Okay. Um, and obviously start small before you start going big. If you want to do um, camera work, I talk to a lot of people that say, hey, I'd love to be able to do what you're doing. I said, great, let's start off small. Let's start getting some good results and then we can start increasing the size of the system. Um, anybody that wants to talk to me about that away from this session, I'm always here. I'm always happy to, to help out. Send me a message, send me an email, give me a phone call. Let's talk about it. Let's keep this safe let's get you going the right direction and let's start improving the quality of the work that that you can do um, and and just make it happen uh, any questions so far are we all fairly happy with where we're going yeah. cool um, secondly once you get past this is is of having a safe system that works uh, for you make it reliable uh, one of the worst things you can do as a camera uh, flyer is to keep landing and saying oh, for whatever reason i didn't get the video i didn't turn my camera on i had a lead failure the batteries were flat i had the wrong card in there's a million and one reasons why you can end up not getting the shot not getting the video um, personally i make all my own leads uh, because i don't trust the flimsiness of the leads i i'm i have to buy i make sure they're soldered well i carry spares i carry spare batteries i carry spare cards um, and the amount of times that it's bailed me out has been huge. Um, yeah, I do lose work. Every now and again, something goes wrong that you just can't, um, uh, can't cater for. I mean, one of the last ones I lost was when I was going out, it was on a, a different aircraft at a really low door, and I waxed the top of the camera and, and just destroyed the lens on the front. Uh, I don't carry spare lenses. I certainly can't change them in free fall. Um, but uh, it's, it's just trying to mitigate the problems so that you can be as successful as possible every time. And the more re reliable you become, then the more people want your work. And, and I see that as just being a, a fundamental basic. Um, also, once you start going for a bigger system, is to start distributing the weight on your helmet evenly. Um, I always work on the basis that my, my gear is fairly heavy, and uh, during deployment, I watch the horizon. So that as, as I come through um, uh, being pulled upright, my neck is in a, in a perfectly straight line where it's, it's strongest. So if I'm going to have a hard opening, my neck is where it's going to be strongest, where it should be. Certainly don't be looking up at your canopy with a, a lot of heavy weight hanging backwards um, and, and your, your, your spine not being straight. Um, I'm sure Ben Nordkamp the other, other week was uh, really happy he wasn't wearing a big camera system. Um, I don't know what sort of G-force it went through, but it was enough to break his femur during the deployment. And that kind of thing is going to do serious damage to your neck uh, with a heavy camera system. Um, Areas of safety to look at in generally in the aircraft, um, extra height and extra bulk of cameras can be a problem. Hitting people in the face or the eyes, um, catching your camera system on, uh, on their gear, uh, reserve handles, faces, eyes, all that sort of thing are potential problems. Stay well aware of them. Uh, people may well have seen me very often with my hands just covering everything so i'm not only protecting my cameras i'm stopping other people while they're moving around from from bashing my gear um it it it, it can be a, a real sort of uh, problem just 
you know, having that extra height on your head, walking into doorways that you don't realize your head's normally quite close to, suddenly you're several inches taller, uh, you bash your cameras. Um, always um, on opening the door, certainly I find that certainly if the door is uh, quite stiff on on trying to open uh, a door like a, a caravan or something like that, I just try and get somebody else to do it. Partly because my cameras are in the way. As the door slides up, I tend to catch the top edge of uh, of one of my lenses. And you know the the gear is expensive, the gear is delicate, and it's set up how I want it. Um, so I'm ready to leave the aircraft with it. The last thing I want is something else. So. People shout at me to get the door up quick, and I take the time just because it's just the, the way I need to do it for me. I'm always happy to get somebody else to open the door, and then I'll, then I'll check the spot and get out. Uh, and uh, just a, a, a point, I always check the spot. Um, just uh, the, the old look before you leap adage is, is just common sense, whether your camera flying or not. Um, and also with building a, re a reliable system is, is to make it easy to maintain. So you can change leads, you can change batteries, you can change cards, you can do everything you need to easily on the helmet. Um, the best way of working around that. Okay, so safety in free fall and under canopy, stay altitude aware. Uh, personally, I jump with two audibles. Uh, it just means that um, if one goes flat, then I've got a second one. They're both set at the same altitude, and I never change the altitude. They're always set at 4,500 feet. I work on the basis that if the people are going to break off and start tracking you at 5,000 feet, fine, I'll get a visual on that. But if 4,500 feet, my mental clock starts ticking. I know where I am. I'm used to that kind of team at time. Whether I'm deploying over the top of a big way at 4,500 feet, that's cool. If I'm going to be following it down to, say, 3,000 feet, I know my mental clock is ticking. I can I can judge that reasonably well. Uh, so I'm, I'm, that that works for me. Uh, you may prefer to do something differently. Uh, and as I say, everybody in uh, camera flying does things very much their own way, has their own system. Uh, but it's got to whatever you do, it's got to work for you. Um, also, whilst we're in free fall, um, yeah, stay hard aware. Don't get um, distracted. It's easy to suddenly look at something and you're not filming the main action. Focus on where the action is, watch what's going on elsewhere through your peripheral vision or just moving your eyes. Keep, keep, uh, keep filming what, what needs to be filmed the whole time. Um, jumping a, a friendly main, I can't stress that enough. Uh, the idea of jumping a main that's not going to give you good openings, soft openings, and preferably on heading openings. I mean, uh, I tend to get off heading openings, but they're not violent. They may be 90 degrees one way or another. And as uh, you don't need me to talk to you about canopy handling, stay safe while you're sorting yourself out. You tend to have um, uh, limited visibility uh, with camera helmets on, such like. Um, when problems happen, they are likely to happen during the deployment. You're going to be close to the ground when they happen. They're not going to happen on a funneled exit. They aren't significant problems. Uh, it's the it's the main deploying into your helmet, uh, the, the canopy collision, that kind of thing, all happening at deployment altitude. You're already low. Uh, so just be aware of, of that sort of thing. Um, Helmet entanglements, that is back a lot to how you build your system and the kind of openings you're going to get on the canopy you're jumping. Um, and obviously having a, um, a, a cutaway system on, on your helmet, I just can't recommend it enough. It's not mandatory over here. It is mandatory in most of Europe. Uh, maybe that's something we could learn from. But uh, if, you, if you're not jumping a cutaway on, on your camera helmet, do yourself a favour and get one. Um, RSLs and sky hooks, um, they're a, a debatable thing. There's a big uh, talk going on from Bruno Brooken on one of the camera flyer forums on Facebook at the moment about it. Uh, the general consensus is that most people will, will use RSLs and, uh, and sky hooks unless they're jumping a really big system. 
um, and also changing uh, should they need to cut away uh, they actually cut away with their neck uh, with their chin on their chest so to get the helmets right out the way of those reserve bridles as, they, as they're coming off so yeah just thinking about doing things subtly different than, than we would perhaps normally do in our reserve drills and, uh, and what have you um, also in free fall no go areas uh, we seen what can uh, be happening if we're flying underneath tandems or directly above tandems that sort of thing definitely no go areas uh, the same can be true of ordinary free fall as well flying with your mates the moment you're underneath somebody you you are a potential problem um, but uh, obviously the last thing we want are deployment inst instances because we're trying to get a shot it uh, stops being worth it okay general safety stay current if you're going to do camera work start doing it build it up stay current don't take a year off then think you can walk straight back into it make sure you don't get distracted by your camera gear set your system up so it's reliable it's dependable it's repeatable and that your skill sets are um, are up there as well we all work at uh, being better skydivers uh, it's no different being a better camera flyer constantly work to be better and constantly work on on improving your skill set your camera set your camera your photographic skills it all helps um, as far as also as far as gear goes um, once you're open stow your slider right out the way uh, i had an instance where i had a uh, a gnarly opening i ended up uh, lower than i wanted to be but still safe uh, i didn't bother stowing the slider it was just one thing i just felt i didn't need to do and when i'm coming into land i'm doing my, my final 90 degree uh, turn into finals and as i did a little bit of front riser the um the slider went under the front of the camera and pulled my head right back up and i could only just see the ground uh, no chance of, uh, of being able to untangle it, just having to make the best of a bad job. So now stowing a slider and keeping it out the way is, is one of my main priorities, regardless of my height on, on something like that. Uh, it's also true of um, stowing away your brake lines. It's easy to be slack and not stow your brake lines uh, properly or the excess brake line. Um, I've had that wrap, wrap around uh, bits of my camera gear on one occasion. So now, I'm, if I use a packer, I have to constantly check to make sure that the um, the packers aren't being slack as well. I don't want loose stuff flying around uh, my ring sight, my cameras, and all this stuff during the deployment. It's just let's mitigate all these risks. Let's stay safe, um, and always have a plan think about what you would do if things do go wrong if you have some kind of entanglement uh, as i say one of the things i think about is both hands over the top are my cameras clear of anything before i cut away uh, if, if if that main is uh is um if i can't get rid of it the last thing i want is the reserve going out and joining it uh, just like the video that we watched a little bit earlier absolute pain in the ass okay sonia asked me what to aim for on every jump and i think consistency um, if you can be reliable if you can deliver the goods that you're asked of uh, then you're a long way to being a really good camera flyer uh, and that only comes really with practice and it's funny that the more we practice the luckier we get um, one of the ways of doing that is to develop your checklist i hope we heard tom talk a lot about checklists and modifying those checklists to suit uh, same things I have um, a checklist on the ground as soon as I get on the drop zone I check all my skydive gear I make sure that first and foremost that if once I get out of the aircraft that uh, I've done everything I can to make that parachute work and get a safe landing out of it then I start looking at my cameras I make sure the batteries are charged the night before I go to the drop zone I make sure the cards are all cleared and empty I make sure I've got all the leads and batteries and that sort of thing but then once my gear is checked, I'm at the drop zone, I then do a thorough check over every aspect of the camera gear. Two video cameras, one stills camera, one flash. And it, uh, it can be narrowed down quite quickly. And jumping your own gear, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll have that in your mind of what works for your gear. Um, 
more things to aim for in every jump is nailing the exit. That's where the interesting shots often happen. Um, it's where things can surprise you right out the door. And yeah, somebody just gives you a look, they give you a thumb up, just be ready to get that shot. Um, and nailing the exit and being confident of, of, uh, of leaving and keeping everything in frame as you go is a huge one for me. Um, and it's going to be different on every aircraft type and it's going to be different on every type of skydive you do. You know, a tandem exit is much different to a, a big way exit and it's different again to, you know, a free fly kind of exit. So, uh, yeah, just stay on top of it. Lots of practice. Start getting good and reliable at it. Um, in free fall, composing the shot. Uh, and at this stage, if, you, if you're going for this kind of level of uh, imagery, then um, having uh, some kind of ring sight uh, will start keeping your, your subject center frame. Um, a lot of people, certainly with smaller cameras, whether you use the little ring stuck on your goggles or the little felt tip mark, whatever works for you, but just so that you know you're actually pointing the cameras the direction they should be. Um, I, I think a lot of us don't realize how much we move our eyes and look with our eyes without moving our head. This focuses you on keeping your head pointing in the right direction. Um, and constantly look at your work and see, is it still center frame? Is it slightly off? Do I need to adjust the sights? You know, it, it's a case of self-monitoring and, and being your own best critic all the way through. Uh, but once you've got things um, center frame, you've got them composed well, start looking at the backdrop. Look past the, the skydivers, see what's down there. Um, I think one of my big regrets is I filmed um, a, a bachelor in the territory uh, one year. I filmed a, a Pops Big Way record. Great, got the shot. And I thought, I'll put bachelor in the background and we'll just, just it'll be nice. So I had the whole town of bachelor. And when I looked at the images, the skydivers just blend into the confused background. I should have gone the other side and put the uh, the empty paddocks there and they would have stood out from it. It would have given me a much better shot. Um, so yeah, un understanding what's gonna happen with the backdrop you're using and also how the light is falling on it, where the sun is coming from. Th those are things that I do quite a lot. Um, it's not so easy in uh, in documentary type filming where you're, you're needing to film the tandem or you're needing to film the, uh, the four way or the big way where you, you are primarily there to, to give the debrief. But it, certainly if you want to take it a step further and get, it, get something more artistic, where the sun is, where the light's coming from and what the background is suddenly start playing a huge part. Um, it's, no, it's no good getting underneath something and filming upwards and having the sun in the background you're just going to get silhouettes and, and halos all over the place. Uh, you need to think about where you're going to go underneath the format formation and, and where you're pointing from that point of view too. Once you've nailed all those sort of things, and obviously nailing um, uh, smooth footage. You know, image stabilization is great, but if you can make your neck do most of the st uh, stimulize, stabilization, you'll end up with a better product again. Uh, technology is great, but if you can do it without the technology, you'll you'll have a better product at the end of it. And uh, yeah, that's what what it's what it is. Now work towards it. Sonia also said said to me, "How do you progress?" Um, well, things you can do to make yourself better. Anything you can do to make yourself better at what you do has has got to improve your skill set and get you more in demand. One thing I always do, especially with uh, a new group, is to watch the dirt dive and study the keys. And I sort of work out what shape the formation is going to be. If it keeps changing and going from something round and compact to something long and thin, how can I make it fit the frame best? Uh, do I need to go up and let uh, the formation breathe as it gets bigger and come back down to keep its frame? That kind of thing. And you can't do that too much on the fly. You need to know what's going to be happening. So studying the, the dive, they may not, uh, the, the jumpers may not consider you part of the skydive, but you very much are, uh, certainly if you want to get a, a good result on it. And also at the same time, when I'm walking out to the aircraft, I'm looking at the light, imagining where, where the run-in will be and what way the first couple of formations are going to be filming and whether I'd be better off on the left side or the right side. Um, to you know, just to make it happen, how's it going to look better? Just asking you these questions all all the time. 
Um, again, the backdrop comes into that. Uh, and I'm also checking the direction of the wind uh, and the direction of the run in and where I can expect it to be opening. So I'm already planning my flight back. Um, it's just a, a thing I do. I don't like surprises. I try and avoid them and I try and avoid rushing. It doesn't always happen and you'll always get surprises when you're least expecting them. But the more bases you cover, the less of them you get. Um, learn your craft, improve your skydiving. The, the old adage used to be that to do camera work, you had to be a better flyer than the people that you were filming. Uh, a lot of that can still be true today. I, I'm not saying I'm a particularly good flyer in some disciplines, but uh, I sort of get there. Uh, uh, and watching people, understanding people, it, you know, what can be happening on the skydive, learn it and, uh, and make, it, make it yours, own it. Increase your knowledge of photography and video work is a real basic one. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, I've got a camera, teach me how to, how to do great photography. And I'd say, well, yeah, okay. I started studying photography when I started um, studying skydiving uh, 37 years ago. Uh, I can't really give you a 20 minute chat on how to become a brilliant photographer. I'm going to say start learning light, start learning your gear, start understanding what the settings will achieve. Um, it's, it's a big open-ended one. I'm happy to talk to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis on, on photography and stuff like that. But let's start with where you are at the moment, where we can go, what you want to achieve, and then we can put something together to, to talk to. I'm happy to analyze anybody's videos or, or stills send them to me let's have a look let's see what i would perhaps have done differently maybe what settings we could change to improve what you got um, anything like that let's say feel free contact me i'm happy to be here and to, and to help where i can um, stay current keep keep doing more of it become good at what you're doing and seek what other people think of your work show them your pictures send it to susie at the asm um, yeah, you might find that if you're submitting regularly and sending stuff, she may not use it. She may want something different, but suddenly you'll find there's an email on your on your on your desktop says, "Hey, I'm after a, a shot of so and so. It's such and such a drop down. Have you got one? You know, just make yourself available. Be helpful. Um, ask questions and be willing to learn. All those things are are all about progress." Uh, one of the big things as well is own your own mistakes. I mean, we all screw up, uh, admit to it. We're not perfect all the time. And camera work, especially if you're just starting out in it, you will get things wrong. You will miss videos. You will screw up somebody's exit. Um, I remember going to the States once and taking out one person in a 24 way because I just got too steep on it, called the burble, went straight through it. And yeah, it cost me a carton, but there we go. Uh, definitely my screw up and uh, it just just learn from those things um, yeah seek guidance ask questions be willing to learn um, I find being helpful is a really good thing uh, if, if you see something in the aircraft that you're not too sure about or, or stuff like that and as a camera flyer you can be disassociated from every everyone else and just Spend your time and have a look around, check chest straps, have a look at um, three ring connections, all these kind of things, helmet buckles undone, stuff like that. You can just be a, a silent pair of eyes that can just help somebody out sometime. Stay helpful. Um, and always, always be your own biggest critic. I still to this day come back and I watch every video I film at home, I watch some of it in slow mo, and I'll start analysing how could I have done this better? Even if it's really good. Could I have tweaked it somehow? Could I have been higher? Could I have been closer? Could I have been a, a different angle to it? And, and constantly asking that sort of question. Um, and it, 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 I, I just find that really useful for me. It, it's, uh, it, it make, sometimes it's enough that I come back and say, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way all that went. I don't know whether I could have done it any better, but then I've got the knowledge that I've done it well. And that's, uh, that's a great thing, I think. Doing something well and knowing you've done it well is, is uh, it's very, very satisfying. Um, we also, somebody asked me about editing images. Uh, 
that's a whole thing again. Um, I've been editing images since the days of black and white photography and having my own darkroom back in the UK sort of 25 years ago. Um, nowadays, it's a lot easier with the, uh, the software that's available. Uh, I use fairly high-end software, but the free stuff that's around, you can do really, really good stuff with. And one of the things I tell people is don't show your crap. You don't necessarily have to delete it because people like hanging on to stuff, but highlight the really good stuff, the stuff that you're proud of, and just show those few images. The best piece of advice I had um, was from a guy called Simon Ward, and he was one of the all-time great camera flyers in the UK. And I remember having jumped my first stills camera. And some of you may have heard this story, but afterwards the next weekend when i got all the prints back in my little cardboard envelope 36 prints i guess uh, most of you are old enough to remember, remember that sort of thing and i went up and said simon have a look at this first camera jump let me know what you reckon and he went through all 36 prints one after the other totally expressionless took him about 15 minutes by which time i'm feeling pretty dejected because there wasn't any reaction on his face at all and um and he said to me i'll give you the best piece of advice ever and he walked to the bin and he threw the packet in the bin and he just held two shots up. He said, these are the only two that are worth showing. He said, but they got lost in amongst all the other 36. He said, show people just these two, people will think you're reasonably good, but don't show the other 34. And I, I do that to this day. Um, of the nationals, I shot nearly 7,000 images and I think I've had about 600 that I kept uh, from that. So yeah, one in 10, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with that. Uh, how many did I actually give that I would put in my portfolio? Maybe four out of, uh, out of that many thousand images, but that's the kind of culling process I will go through. I'll take lots, today's technology, it doesn't cost a huge amount to uh, delete images. It's not like you're throwing away heaps of film and, uh, uh, and heaps of prints. And those that you have, you can do some editing on. And simple editing is as simple as crop the image. Virtually every, um, every uh, photographic editing program I've seen or have used gives you the ability to crop the image, to straighten the horizon, and to put the subject centre frame and cut the background down a bit. And you'll be surprised how much better your images just look doing something as simple as that. Uh, you don't have to go into all the high-tech end of, uh, of what these programs are capable of. If you're capable of doing it, fine, but start just with cropping and straightening horizons. It's, uh, it's just marvellous what that will do. Yeah. Um, I know Kian has, uh, is working on a, an editing article at the moment, and uh, there's been quite a few photographers that have been involved in editing the same images just to see how they turn out. I found it really, uh, really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the results when he when he uh, actually publishes the article. I don't think it's too far away, but yeah, could be could really be a good one. All right, really, um, takeaway points: stay safe, know your gear, learn your craft, strive to be better, work with mentors wherever you can, and remember: the more you practice, the luckier you get. So, Really, from there, any questions I'm happy to answer, whether you want to catch later or answer and ask now, feel free. Hey Steve, have a look in the chat. There's a few questions there. Oh, bloody hell. God, so there is. I haven't been noticing that. That's okay. The first time, the first one was from Robbo asking, do you plan to run courses at DZs when things return to normal? Oh, absolutely. Um, the thing to do there is, is get me there um talk with jules uh, she's she's been really helpful in uh, in getting me to some places i was hoping to be down at eldersley uh, for their 60th but unfortunately that didn't uh, didn't happen but yeah more than happy to uh, talk to me talk to jules I'll, I'll be as available as i can for for anyone good one um another one steve which i think would be good to talk about is the camera jackets the wing camera jackets camera jackets yep again it's a personal thing um i switched to a camera jacket as opposed to a full suit um, a few years back 
and I've never regretted it. Uh, it's certainly jumping in Queensland where it's uh, hot and sticky. Being able to wear shorts or uh, choose a different set of uh, trousers is good. If you are going to a camera suit or camera jacket with wings for the first time, do a jump without cameras. Just focus on what the what the uh, the, the the range you suddenly have. Um, follow something out and fly around it just without cameras. Just get used to it. Go for a few practice pulls high up. You'd be amazed at trying to do a standard uh, a standard pull with wings. How suddenly you can start spinning quite violently. Um, you know, great for twists on opening, but uh, not necessarily what you want. Um, also, with any kind of wings, especially if it's big wings, is when you go to reach for your uh, for your handle uh, of putting the uh, putting your hand through the gap to, where where the wing can go around your leg strap. Uh, that can really ruin your day. So, yeah, practice, learn your gear. Okay, um, uh, we've got editing software you touched on the editing. Um, can you please talk about how you integrated a flash into your equipment and techniques? Yep, um, I felt the need for flash because I like to fly underneath things and instantly uh, your subjects start becoming silhouette and uh, just having a flash to kick a little bit of light in just gives them enough detail. Um, I find it works really, really well, especially in Australia when we're, we're jumping a lot with a, a very harsh overhead sun. Um, just being able to kick a bit of light in takes the, the dark shadows out of the eyes, it, the dark shadows underneath the nose and the dark shadows that run down uh, underneath the chin. They can also put a little bit of catch light in the eyes um, you know, somebody's looking, they've just got that glint in their eyes and it just brings the photos alive. Um, it's an awful lot of extra weight, uh, a lot of ex extra expense. And yeah, I mean, I, I don't put a flash up there for, for any other reason than it improves the quality of what I get for the kind of photography I want to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, talk about flash. What camera settings do you prefer? Manual mode, AP priority, auto manual focus, favorite lens, etc. etc. Okay, um, I always use autofocus. Um, right back from my early days with cameras in the 1990s when autofocus first came out, and I've doctored the leads, so I build my own leads so I can actually turn the autofocus on in the aircraft so that the entire jump, the autofocus is working. Um, it's just something I turn off again as soon as I land. Uh, settings, it depends on the skydive I'm doing, but uh, typically it will be um, aperture priority or manual. And very often I will bias the exposure. So I usually overexpose. Um, again, this is a, a photography question where, you know, I'm, I'm bringing in 30 plus years of photography. Um, happy to give you some basics of where to start, but then you look at the results you get, you analyze your own work, you become your own self-critique and saying, maybe if I'd done this a little differently, I'd have got a different result. And having jumped camera for sort of 30 years, yeah, you know, I've kind of gone the directions I like to go with my equipment, knowing the kind of situation I'm gonna be in. Um, you know, the, the, the um, settings I used on a night jump, in fact, you were on that one, Ben. Uh, I actually sat down and thought, I haven't done anything like this before. I sat down and went through every setting on the camera, which would optimize me best for this kind of shot. And it kind of worked. Um, yeah, and that was so radically different to any other settings I'd ever used before. But it worked. Yeah. How are we going? An insurance question. Uh, you... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, which insurance company covered loss or damaged equipment during skydiving activities? Is there one? Oh, I used to have one in the UK and uh, I actually made a claim on it. And at the time I was also putting cameras on big kites and doing some aerial photography with those. Uh, when the guy saw it, they paid me the check and said, your policy is now canceled and we will never ever insure you again. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. I, again, in the UK, I used to be able to get my camera gear insured as part of my household gear. 
Um, but not anymore. They they just don't want to know. Uh, I've tried a few times, and the uh, the amount that I'd be paying insurance is actually cheaper to risk the gear. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, it's a bit of a doozy. What's your emergency procedures if you're caught in a tandem drogue and the tandem instructor has cut away? Uh, you mean you get gift wrapped? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> You, you just avoid the drogue. I mean, I've I've never had an issue. With it. I did film. Uh, I filmed uh, somebody hitting a drogue on uh, it's on one of the C seventeen jumps actually, um, and uh, yeah, it was quite interesting. But uh, there was no cutaway involved in that. I just wouldn't go anywhere near the drogue. It's uh, you know, it's I've I've never had an issue where I've even gone close to it. So I. I Difficult one to answer. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Okay, um, that looks like that's all the questions in the chat bar. Um, okay. Does anyone else have any comments or questions for Steve? Anyone want to add something? Anyone at all? I can't have covered it that well. <laughs> How about the obligatory, what's the best photo you've ever taken? Or what's the best project you've worked on? I tell you the photo that moved me the most, and it's one that I didn't actually take, but uh, it was at the world meet in uh, Carlwyn in '94, the CRW meet there, and I got to jump in with the flag, the British flag thing, because I was part of the British team, and uh, somebody gave me a copy of the print, and yeah, nice enough shot coming in between the trees outside the back of the resort there for anybody that uh, that knows the situation, but. Um, it was the reaction of uh, when I showed it to my mum and she just started crying. And uh, yeah, that was uh, one of my all time favorite skydive memories from a photo. Yeah. What about a, a, a project that you've worked on? Like, has it been something that's been most memorable or most challenging even? Oh yeah, the, um, the uh, I'm a celebrity uh, stuff we do um, for the British one where we're, we're actually uh, filming tandems. Uh, from helicopters, which is great fun, but they put the, the um, celebrities go in one helicopter, the camera flyers are in a, a second helicopter, and you're getting out usually somewhere just below 10,000 feet, and they want you to get everything. And uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty interesting chase scenario. Um, a, a lot of fun, and you know, you suddenly find you, the landing area is on the side of a mountain, uh, surrounded by drug farms and stuff like that <laughs> but it makes for a, it makes for a, a real fun challenging time i think the things that give me the most satisfaction are the things that challenge me the most uh, because when you do them you think yeah all, all the um the standard jumping you do is the training for the days when you need to do the exceptional jumping and uh, you know you must be doing something right when you manage to do that yeah a lot of fun in that a lot of fun. Mm. Very good. Okay, Steve, um, has anyone else got any any other comments they want to add? Anything to say? Any questions, experiences? No, we're all good. Yeah. Um, Steve, Hi, Gary, Gary. Um, I know we've had a few conversations in the past uh, about you, you being a commercial photographer have you got yep. any tips for people around um you know when you do jobs and projects of how you negotiate your uh deals and things like that i know it's a tricky area it is the, the photography can be a little bit like skydiving if, if you want to end up with a small fortune start with a big one um but basically don't undersell yourself um people are quite happy to let you work for nothing and i could work for nothing every day of the week uh, but i've chosen not to um, and it's difficult yeah it's difficult but i i do a lot of what i do because i thoroughly enjoy it it gives me the lifestyle that i enjoy it gives me time to spend doing other things that i enjoy and the passion i get from photography is just infinite absolutely infinite also i know you've invested a lot of money in your equipment I mean, given mm -hmm. uh, uh, photography equipment now with GoPros and things like that, what what's the reason that you 
go up that level for, for and spend the amount of money that you do? Because I know it's pretty significant. Yeah, it's 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 quality. It's about quality. Um, the the quality of the images that I get with the gear I use, I would not be able to get with a with a point of view action camera or phone. It they are very you you. What am I trying to say here? It's not the gear that gets the image. Having the gear makes it easier and will perhaps push the boundaries of what you can get. I mean, uh, a guy with a, a GoPro on a G3 is going to be able to get into the same place and take the same shot. It's not going to have the same quality. Uh, that's what it's about. That's, that's why my camera gear is worth about three times my jump gear. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. 20, 25, 30 grand, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly over 20 grand, yeah. Yeah. And having used lots of different types of equipment, is there any any um, particular manufacturer that you've really gravitated to over the years? Well, I started off with Canon. Um, I think a lot of people did in the uh, early days. I switched probably a couple of years ago to Sony because um, Canon were taking their time coming out with a mirrorless system uh, that was uh, that was realistically usable. Um, Sony were streets ahead at that point. And so I switched to them. I, I bit the bullet and jumped ship, and I've not regretted it. But it's been a steep learning curve after you know 30 years of working with one manufacturer's gear, and it's been consistently the same every time I've I've upgraded to the the, the latest gear they had. Uh, not too many changes, but going to the Sony has been huge. It was a massive learning curve, and obviously I uh, ended up having to take most of last year off. Um, so I was on the ground with all this gear, trying to understand it and needing to get it in the air to see what the results would be and, and being forced to be on the ground. But uh, we seem to be getting there. I'm pretty happy with the way I'm running things now. Um, and I'm very impressed with the quality I'm getting. Mm. And, and you and I both go back to um, the days, I don't know, Shane Sparks is on the call as well, of using film. Yep. Um, digital do you do you miss film or are you really digital man now no I'm, I'm entirely digital the, the the lovely thing about film is I think that's where I cut my teeth and to get it right with a film camera with no real editing afterwards you had to get it right in camera so that gave me a good background to take that into the digital world because I still try and keep that mentality the idea that I'll be able to fix that in post-processing, that's not what I want to do. I want to get it right and then just tweak it in post-processing. -post -post Can't always do it, but, you know, that's, that's my mentality for that. Yeah, yeah it's not that's a question not, of just firing off the shutter that you can do now and take 100 photos. Back in the day, when you had oh, 36 shots on a roll of film, you had to be oh, exactly. very selective about what you, yeah. when you press that button. It's also pretty interesting because I, I talked to some fairly new camera flyers and one guy showed me that he took 700 shots on one jump. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. I, I usually take between 30 and 40 still. Um, you know, if, if there's not much happening on the jump, I've taken as little as 12. Uh, I don't see the point of just wasting energy and time and disk space and all the time in post-processing culling images that didn't need to be taken in the first place. Yeah. Um, there's also shooting with a flash. There's no point in me being on a high speed motor drive because the flash is only going to go off on the first one and the rest won't have the flash. And it's that effect that I want. So I'm trying to choose the moment uh, when, when I shoot the stills. Hey, Steve, just on that, on that, on that yeah. point, um, uh, what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, does, I mean, doesn't the Sony have, out of all the range of cameras, the best low, uh, low light uh, sensitivity? So, for, you know, when, you, when you're taking those beautiful sunset shots, shots, etc., I mean, the Sony stands above the rest, I think, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, one of the things I found with the Sony cameras that I'm using is they really don't like to be underexposed. If there's any underexposure, the, uh, the, the, the noise, the graininess of the, the, the image is horrendous. And, it, and I can't really bring that back. So I work on overexposing everything. I used to with the Canons, but I have to be more careful of it with the Sonys. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. So some of it in the early stage, I was really just disappointed until I realised that was the problem. Once I sussed that out, 
then I consistently got stuff I was happier with and I could work with. Oh, so, so are you saying the low light sensitivity isn't as effective or, or? No, what I'm saying is they don't like being underexposed. And usually when you're dealing with low light, the first thing that goes, people let the exposure slip. You have to be much more conscious of your exposure. Um, Thank you. You're welcome, Ozzy. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, looks like that's it, Steve. Anyone have anything to add? No, okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. That was great. Awesome. Hope you enjoyed it.